What's up guys, this is Will Wit Live, episode 15. Today we're talking about the Holocaust and why people don't know about it. We're talking about a video from a police officer that you have to see where he dismantles the left. And we're talking about the California wildfires. Let's do this. All right, so if you guys have been on Twitter today, you will see that one of the most trending things happening right now is people not knowing about the Holocaust. There was a study that came out that said nearly two-thirds of U.S. young adults unaware that six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. If you guys know or have been following me and Prager for a while, you know I actually did a video where I went on Hollywood Boulevard and I asked people if they knew what the Holocaust is. And... It was one of those videos where I thought I could go out there and I was maybe going to be proven wrong. I was like, I don't know if people, like, they say they don't know about the Holocaust, but I think that they actually do. And I went out there and my, I was totally wrong. These people had no idea what the Holocaust was. They didn't know that 6 million Jews died. I mean, if you guys saw the video where I did the video where I compared Donald Trump to Hitler and had people rank them, and I asked those two students, they said Donald Trump was worse than Hitler because Donald Trump was getting rid of food stamps which is childish, apparently. The fact that people don't know what the Holocaust is is not just a reflection that our schools aren't teaching people education. It is an entire culture problem where the left has infiltrated education and people are too busy learning about social justice content, the 1619 Project, about how racist white people are, about how terrible the police are, and about how horrible America is. If we were learning in schools how great America was, then people would know about the Holocaust because of all the great things that Americans did to put an end to World War II, to put an end to the Holocaust, going into Nazi Germany and freeing a lot of these people. And I think there's a big issue like this. Like in the 1930s in Nazi Germany, I mean, they were taking away the Jewish people's weapons. They were taking away their guns. They, I mean, they had no Second Amendment in Germany during that time. Uh, we see what happens in tyrannical regimes when people's rights are stripped away. I mean, but when you don't learn history and you don't know these things, then of course when you see these certain things happening in your own country or in countries nearby throughout time, then you don't know why they're happening. Or you don't see the, the significance of what it means to actually lose your freedom. I mean, I would go, I did a video at a, a Second Amendment, uh, anti-Second Amendment march. And it's like these people were against the Second Amendment. They were literally going and marching to have their rights taken away from them. How insane is that? That these people living in America, these young people my age, are so privileged in this country that they go out on the streets and march for their rights to be taken away. That is absolutely insane to me. I mean, there are people who go out there the same thing for the First Amendment, who go out and say, you know, hate speech shouldn't be allowed. They are going and marching and telling people that they no longer want to have the First Amendment. That if you say something that is upsetting, that you shouldn't be allowed to say it. These are the same things that happen in tyrannical regimes, like in Nazi Germany, like in communist Russia, like in communist China, where people aren't allowed to speak their mind. They're not allowed to have a way to defend themselves. But these people don't know history. Young people my age, they don't know history anymore. And so we are bound to repeat these same things if we don't learn from our mistakes. That is why it is so shocking to see that two-thirds of young adults didn't know the six million Jews are killed in the Holocaust because it is such an important lesson for everyone to learn. It is one of the most evil atrocities to ever take place throughout world history, especially in modern history. And the fact that people don't know it is disgusting and vile and is a, a huge, disgusting look at what our education system in America is doing. Our education system should be teaching this in every single history class throughout the country. And instead of focusing on the good that Americans did to put a stop to this, to put a stop to the Holocaust in World War II, we focus on about how terrible America is, how racist America is, and how bad it is for people living in this country right now. When in reality, you live in the freest country in the world. I mean, and then in the same thing, it was one in ten people hadn't even heard that the Holocaust ever even happened. Does that not just blow your mind? You know, as conservatives, I mean, one of the main things that we really need to focus on that should be one of our main goals that we're pushing for in the later years is fixing our education system. It's something that we as conservatives should take on the helm and be our number one issue. Because if we can't educate the young people in this country, the people who are growing up in this country right now, the next Gen Z, what is going to happen to this country? If they don't even know what the Holocaust is, how do you think that they are going to have any sort of idea how to lead this country and move it in the right direction if they don't even know the past and some of the most horrific things to ever happen in the past? It is imperative that we focus on education and focus on teaching people the real history of what has happened in this country and around the world. And if you're a teacher or parent who cares about this, go to PragerU.com. We just launched PrEP Today, which is a network, a coalition of parents and teachers who care about these things within education, who want to have pro-American values in their education. Go to PragerU.com. Check out PrEP. <laughs> Hey 
Guys, if you are in Southern California, I got huge news. This might be the biggest news of your life. Because I am premiering my new short film, Religion of Green, Friday, September 25th at 6.30 p.m. at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. I got a graphic up on the screen right now so you can see it. We're really excited about it. Uh, some critics have came on and said, this is the greatest film of the last hundred years. So, you know, it's really good. I really hope you guys can make it. Friday, September 25th, 7 p.m. at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. See you guys there. And this is our segment, Will's Wit. I thought of that name myself. It is where I show you guys something funny that I did this week, which there isn't much. But this week, I actually have something good for you guys. Check it out. Looks good. Just want to make sure it's really slipped back. Hello, I'm Gavin Newsom, governor of California. And here in California, we believe in science, which is why we know all of our recent fires are entirely caused by climate change. It's not because 90% of fires are caused by arsonists, or because we didn't clear out the dead wooden debris in our forests, or because we rely way too heavily on wind and solar. It's because of climate change. Anti-science Republicans come up to me and say, Gavin, how come you live in the wealthiest state in the union, in the wealthiest country in the world, and you can't even stop your cities from having blackouts and power outages? To those people I say, you're a racist Nazi science denier. Because in California, we believe in science. We know that men can have periods and give birth. We know that there are more than two genders, and we think pedophilia should be legalized. Because that is the California way, the California promise in the, in the golden state. Because we're burning gold. <laughs> Right, moving on to our next segment, which is called Clip of the Week, which is basically we take a clip weekly and react to it. Quick story. The other night, we get a call from a black man saying that he'd been the victim of a crime. I show up, and I was able to determine very quickly that, yes, in fact, he was the victim of a crime. As I'm standing on the side of the road taking a statement, these young ladies pull up in a car next to us and start screaming at the top of their lungs, Black Lives Matter. And whereas, yes, black lives do matter. If you pull up and you automatically assume that this man was the suspect of a crime when he was in fact the victim based on the color of his skin, you're racist. Boom. I love this guy. I think this was a great video. I mean, the fact that he comes out as a police officer and actually says this, I think is honestly, first of all, really brave. And second of all, really informative for people. Because a real-world example of a police officer trying to do their job and help an African-American who's living in this country and then having Black Lives Matter come out and call them out and say that they are racist is just like the epitome of hypocrisy. You know, it's like the same thing with affirmative action. Where, like, the left says, you know, affirmative action is such a great thing. It's helping all these minorities. And it's like, no, it's not. You are being racist by implementing affirmative action, okay? You're basically saying as a premise, black people, Hispanic people, they're not as good as white people. So we need to give them a, a leg up in society. We need to have affirmative action to help them. It's like, that's racist. You are assuming something about black people and Hispanic people without even knowing who they are. You assume that they're not good enough to get into the school uh, without affirmative action or that they don't have the money or that they're not smart enough. That's racist. It's the exact same thing with this guy, this cop video, where he's coming on and saying that he was trying to help a black guy who had been the victim of a crime. And the left comes up and says, no, you are racist because they don't even look at the full story. You have these people going out and protesting and rioting in the streets and they don't look at the full story either. If the left actually did their research and looked at the facts of these things that were going on, then we wouldn't be having all of these riots and all these protests going on right now in America. But the left doesn't look at the facts. They look at their feelings first. So when this whole stuff happened with George Floyd or the Jacob Blake or the other guy uh, in uh, Atlanta, and they come on and they start protesting and rioting without having all the information, and then you later find out that the, 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 truth, that, the truth that they put out there first isn't really the truth. It's like if you would have just waited for all the evidence, then you wouldn't be having to be destroying your own communities. You wouldn't have to be burning down buildings. You know, there was a time in America, believe it or not, I know, it's crazy to think, where people actually looked for the truth. Can you believe that? People used to go out and find the truth. But now they see like these Black Lives Matter people riding past this police officer. They go and find something to fit their narrative. And people do this all over. I mean, this is kind of the, the power of social media, that people can go online and find something that only agrees with their narrative. And then they don't have to look up any other information, right? They don't have to search out other facts or search out other viewpoints. They can find something so easily that fits their agenda and they never have to do any actual research. And that's exactly what is happening with these leftists in this country, where they have a narrative, they have an agenda. 
agenda, and they will find anything without doing the research to make it fit their agenda. And just to add on to this, white leftists are the most racist people in America. I mean, the way that they, they prop black people up as props is absolutely disgusting. Think about the black squares. I mean, you're posting a black square saying that you support black people, but then when it comes, when the chickens come home to roost, chickens come home to roost, when you're actually supposed to do something to help black people, you don't do anything at all. You sit on your butt on your couch all day long and you post black squares and you tell people you care about black people. But if you cared about black people, you'd be going out and, and advocating for fatherhood in these communities. You'd be advocating against the welfare state, against affirmative action, uh, for better education in these communities. But you don't do that because you're, you're lazy and you're, you suck. Okay, if you actually cared about black people, you'd go and do something, but you don't care and you're using them as a prop. That is what white leftists do. They don't actually care about the, the, the feelings and the, the well-being of black people in this country. They care about what other white leftists think about them on social media. All right, this is a new segment. We're calling it Debunk of the Week, where basically I go on and I take things that the left has said or done and I prove them wrong because I'm Will Witt and I know literally every single thing in the world. So this is Debunk of the Week. Today we're talking about the forest fires in California. There was this page called Occupy Democrats. You guys might have heard of it. It's full of lies. I mean, I was on there for like half an hour and the thing is just lie after lie. If you did any research, like I just talked about before, you know the things they're saying are lies. But they had this post. That said, in case you are wondering what a climate emergency looks like, this is how many fires are burning up and down the West Coast. Now, there's no, there's no debunking that there are fires happening right now in California. It's actually pretty terrible. There's smoke everywhere. It is hotter than the blowout Nancy Pelosi got at her secret salon. It is hot out there and it's smoking. It's smoking hot. And this is not because of climate change, though. That is the one thing. I saw this thing from Alex Epstein where he talked about this. It was, I thought it was great. It's like, okay, imagine you're living in your house and you turn up your thermostat by one degree. Does your house catch on fire? Of course not. It's like a ridiculous statement to think that climate change, if your house goes up in, or the forest goes up one degree Fahrenheit, that the whole thing is going to catch on fire. This fi these fires are happening because of the ineptitude and how terrible California is at handling any of these things. First thing, they rely way too much on renewable energy. The second thing is that 90% of fires are caused by arsonists. I mean, this fire was caused by a gender reveal party. A gender reveal party of all things. I mean, and then you got Trevor Noah coming out and saying, you know, getting all upset because you're not supposed to have a gender reveal party for someone who hasn't been born yet because they haven't chosen their gender yet. So they shouldn't have had their gender reveal party in the first place, according to the leftist dogma, but that's why the fire started. And most of the other fires are happening because of this, not because of climate change, not because of lightning strikes. And then you have uh, California didn't clear out all the brush and debris and the deadwood within their state. They're basically saying, uh, we love the environment, we're so green, we're so progressive that we're going to keep all these trees because we love the trees and we don't need God, we just need the earth and the earth is God so we don't want to burn it or, or change it in any way. And so they didn't and then when a fire comes, there's all this brush and all this deadwood that the fire just goes through and destroys and just it continues to stay strong because of all this. So if California was actually responsible and not so bad at this, they could actually go in and stop these fires. But they, they are ruining it. And they're ruining their state. And to talk more about this, I got Ian Pryor, who is a spokesperson for the Empowerment Alliance. Really smart guy. Really great organization. You guys should check him out. And we talk about this, renewable energy and natural gas. Check it out now. Well, we have here today Ian Pryor, who is a spokesperson for Empowerment Alliance. Thank you so much for joining me and, and being here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Empowerment Alliance before we get started? Sure, yeah. The Empowerment Alliance, we started about a year ago. Uh, and simply put, we're about harnessing American ingenuity, free market principles, and the abundance of low-cost, clean natural gas to have a realistic and effective approach to energy consumption in contrast to, to the Green New Deal. So, for the past year, what we've been focusing on is building up a, a coalition of political leaders, thought leaders, and grassroots folks that we can, we can give information to, give facts to, educate them about the benefits of natural gas and about the costs and uh, dangers of the Green New Deal. So in, in many ways, it's, it's bigger, but we're focused on providing information and education about natural gas and you know, clean, efficient, and low-cost energy. 
Yeah, I think looking at the free market is really the way. I mean, I use this example a lot. You know, something like the flash drive, which has saved millions of trees. It was something created in the in the free market. You know, you no longer need to carry all these papers around. You can put it on a device, and that was something created in the free market. It seems like when the government tries to get involved in helping climate change, quote unquote, it seems that they mess everything up. Are you seeing that same type of thing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and look, you know, we're not against any other kind of energy per se, right? It's not like we're against renewable energy or against, uh, you know, that as a concept, but it's just not, it's not practical right now. It's, it's extremely expensive. Um, and I think that you, you see the results in, in California as sort of a, this mini green new deal and the, you know, what comes with that. I saw a tweet today and, you know, I, it's funny, I follow, um, you know, a few people on, on Twitter that have a column where it's, you know, Ilan Omar, AOC, um, Ion, basically the squad, um, and it, it'll make you crazy if you have that column. So I would not recommend doing that. But, but it was a tweet saying, you know, let's save the earth, earth, let's keep fossil fuels in the ground. Well, that's just not realistic right now. And, you know, maybe in 100 years or 200 years, we'll be looking at a different calculus on how things work. But the bottom line is, you're looking at natural gas specifically. I mean, we have the cleanest air we've had in over 50 years, in part due to the natural gas revolution. Um, you know, 30% of America's energy needs are supplied by natural gas. It's a, it's a low cost solution for people who, you know, right now, especially with, with COVID, especially with all the shutdowns, the last thing people need is for their business costs to go up. The last thing they need is for their household energy costs to go up. So switching to something that is just, you know, wholly inefficient and look, we're not, we're not all wealthy enough to put solar panels on our roof. It, it just, it strikes, you know, it strikes me and it strikes a lot of people as, as dangerous for, for this country. And speaking of California, I mean, we've been having blackouts here, power outages across the state. I mean, the fires and everything. What, what is the, the, the main reason why this is happening? Well, it's got the worst electrical grid in the country. I mean, they have essentially adopted, you know, what many people want to have throughout the, throughout the country, which is sort of a, a Green New Deal light. And you, you cannot rely solely on solar power. You cannot rely solely on wind power for electricity because what happens is if it gets too hot, if you don't have the, you know, the right energy mix and it crashes, then you don't have the ability to provide energy on a backup system that's powered by natural gas or coal to provide, the, um, provide people and businesses with the electricity that they need. And so what happens is the prices skyrocket and people are left without energy. So you have to essentially ration that energy, which as I understand is what's happening in California. I mean, I'm curious to, to hear your take. You, you know, you're out there. Well, you know, what is it like on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I mean, it's been completely smoky here in California. I had a lot of friends who had blackouts. Luckily, I, I wasn't affected where I lived. But a lot of other people, you know, lost power over the weekend when it was so hot. And what I found to be the, the, the funniest part was that you got a guy, Eric Garcetti, you know, the, the mayor of Los Angeles. And he comes on and says, you know, it's time for everyone to set their thermostats to 78 degrees, right, to, to stop climate change and so that we don't all have our blackouts. And it's like I can guarantee you that he is sitting at home with a cool 65-degree temperature in his house but he tells the rest of us that we need to set ours to 78 degrees when you when you're looking at these these people in charge these elitists and they put things like renewable energy in place when it doesn't actually uh, have the capacity to power the entire state on itself why do you think that they do this could you, could you repeat that again i'm sorry i didn't basically like the, these these politicians and elitists they they want renewable energy to be the only thing to power the state even though the renewable energy as you just said isn't enough to power the entire state without you know other types of energy coming in as well why do you think they push for these renewable energies so hard when they have proven basically that they're not going to work right now well i think it's a combination of things i mean i think they truly believe in their own rhetoric that you know, in some cases, you know, the world is going to end in, in what, 12 years if we don't switch from, from fossil fuels. I also think, like anything else when we're talking about this, money, money talks. And I'm sure there's, you know, interests out there that are pushing people on the left to move to renewable energies because it'll benefit certain, certain companies, certain industries, um, if they have, you know, their side pushing those policies. But ultimately, that, that, that may work for, you know, the cylindras of the world, although I guess it didn't work for the cylindras of the world, but it's not going to work for, you know, everyday Americans. I mean, look, like moving it back to natural gas, 
I believe it's $121 billion has been saved by businesses from 2008 to present, right? That $121 billion allows businesses to invest in new things like jobs, for example. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of different ways that they can innovate, that they can make energy more efficient. What we don't have is ways right now to make wind power or solar power more efficient, which is why you see so much in the way of, you know, government intervention, um, political intervention to try and make these things go when they're just not there yet. But again, they may be there at some point, but let the free market decide that. Because if we keep letting government get involved in this top-down regulation, it's ultimately going to hurt the people that rely on this, whether it's a business who employs you know, hundreds of people or whether it's a household that you know, where four to five people live and require those energy needs. Yeah, I think that's the perfect thing is letting the free market handle it. If the renewable energy was good enough and it worked and it was cheap and abundant, there's, there would be no reason why everyone wouldn't use it. You know, there would be no debate. It's not like people are anti-renewable energy like that just because they hate it and they want to stick to fossil fuels. They are because it's, it's just not good enough. It doesn't work well enough and it's not cheap enough or abundant enough. What do you see as the future of energy in this country? Well, look, I think that over the next hundred years, you're going to see, a, you know, a greater reliance of natural gas or on natural gas. I mean, there's, there's a century's worth that we know of, of usable natural gas in the ground. And it's, it's low cost. It's extremely affordable. And, you know, interesting story came out a couple of months ago where Jesse Jackson is in Illinois pushing for a, a natural gas pipeline in a low income area because they recognize that, look, this is important for consumers. This is a consumer friendly energy source. It's cleaner than most other energy sources. And it will eventually serve as a bridge for, you know, 100 years down the line or 75 down, years down the line where we become, you know, more diverse in our energy portfolio. I mean, I, I want to go back to something you said earlier, you know, putting your, putting your thermostat at 78 degrees I mean, for, you know, I remember when I had my kids, you can't put, you're not supposed to have your thermostat at 78 degrees if you have a newborn baby. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, Daddy's Home too. It's like one of my favorite random, like, Christmas yeah, yeah. movies. But there's a scene where they're just fighting over the thermostat. I feel like that's the way I am with, you know, with my wife or when I go to my mother-in-law's where the thermostat's at like 74. I'm like, no, 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 no. 68, it's the highest we're gonna go. I cannot imagine having to keep my house at 78 degrees when it's you know 90 degrees outside it's not healthy it's not safe and it's you know it's not the way it should be and you know there are solutions to that which is using available low cost clean energy like natural gas and i'd also add that you know for these folks that you know they they promote clean energy and i, I think you know i I've, I've heard you talk about it and i think it applies to so many different areas that the left you know they put forth their um their agenda and if you're against that agenda then somehow you are you know you're for dirty energy you're for pollution you're for all these things and that's just not the case we're just trying to come to a reasonable solution that works for as many people as possible and allows us to develop energy in a a cost effective and smart way for the future as opposed to just tanking the economy or tanking people's livelihoods in order to get to this you know pipe dream of you know, total renewable energy now, as, as many advocate. Well, it's just, it's, it's a religion to these leftists. The climate change movement is a religion to them. You know, something like recycling your plastic straw is a tenet of their religion. You know, if you don't do that, it's not that just you don't care about the environment. It's that you're a morally bad person if you don't do these kind of things. And so they put that on all facets of this, whether it's, you know, using renewable energy versus fossil fuels, all sorts of different things that they try and shame people for having a difference of opinion. So I'm really happy that you're speaking up about the free market and the, and the environmental things that you're talking about. Out and we're going to keep doing it at Prager U. And Ian, I really appreciate you coming on and talking with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great. And so where can people find more information about what you guys are doing? Sure. Uh, they can go to empoweringamerica.org. And there they can, they can join our Blue Energy Nation, which is our, our grassroots network. Or they can also sign our Declaration of Energy Independence, which really talks about the four pillars uh, that we're, you know, we ask our signers to um, you know, really focus on, which is energy independence for national security, low cost energy, abundant energy, and clean energy. And natural gas really provides all those four. And if we stick with those four principles, you know, we're going to get things done in the way that, that we should, which is going to provide everybody with clean, affordable energy.
Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, make sure you check out the Empowerment Alliance and I really appreciate having you on. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Will. Thanks. Take care. All right, Taylor, get ready for advice column where I ask you guys on social media that I'm Dr. Will today and I'm taking your guys' hot takes and anything you need advice on. I'm here for you. Dr. Will, that's great. I love that. Um, let's start with Joanna who asks, I need help choosing what I want to do in life for a career. What would you say to Joanna about choosing a career? Joanna, life comes at you fast faster than you know <laughs> and okay I, I don't know when I was getting in my career like I just it just came to me you know I had all these other plans and these visions that I was going to have for my life you know I was going to be a veterinarian and then I was going to be a writer and then I was going to work in music and then this just came to me you know I started getting really involved in the political scene and I was like this is what I want to do so if you're at a point right now where you're in high school or university and you don't know what you're supposed to do with your life that's okay that's okay you'll keep growing and keep maturing and you'll find something that really interests you and then you'll make a career out of that or you'll make that at least part of some sort of hobby you know your job doesn't always have to be like your number one thing in life as well like if you have a loving family a loving husband um, whatever it might be, like your job doesn't have to be your number one priority. Your family and, and God and those kind of things are much more of a priority. So, uh, but I, I would just, and I would wait, I would wait. Don't be too anxious to, to get all grown up and, and find out what you want to do. Just experience everything, you know, free love, you know, do your thing and you'll figure it out eventually. All right. Great, great stuff from Dr. Will there. All right. Uh -huh. Number two, um, <laughs> Let's see. Dr. Will, how do I get a woman to like me? They always only want to be friends. How does our friend, this guy's name is, it looks like his name is Will. How do we get our friend Will out of the friend zone? First thing, my number one tip, it works every time, be rich. If you're rich, it, women just want you. That's just how it is. It's easy. If you're not rich, then be confident is the first thing. Okay? If you're going up to this woman and simping for her and saying, oh, you're, you're so beautiful and, and, and I, I, I would defend you from all the, the bad men who want to hurt you and all that, like, you sound like a soy boy. You need to be confident. Okay? This doesn't mean be rude to her or be mean or be aloof all the time. This means you know, focus on the things that she really likes and don't just give it up so quick. Don't just give it up so easily and say, oh, I like you so much. You know, it, takes, it takes confidence. It takes actually talking to them and, and don't just tell them you like them right off the bat. This is, this one is doctor to doctor. So we have wow. Dr. Rockstar asking Dr. Will. Um, what, what, what do you specialize in Dr. Rockstar? Rock. <laughs> She's a, a graduate of the school of rock. Oh. She's the principal of the school, the school of rock. <laughs> principal and a doctor. <laughs> yeah. Her and Jack Black are, are really close. What um, is your question? But Dr. Rockstar's question is, I'm a conservative professor here, that's good to know, um, living in Colorado with very little academic freedom. Help. So. <laughs> you make it sounds so sad. She's drowning like, in a sea of res academic restriction. And uh, what does Dr. Will have to say to conservative professors who aren't allowed to teach what they want to teach and are being forced to teach leftist dogma here's my diagnosis to you first things first if you want to teach students conservative values teach them conservative values if you're going to get fired from your job for teaching that america is a good country and not a racist country i mean do you really want to work at that university a university or a school that is coming and telling you that if you don't say america's racist then we're going to fire you I mean, that's a terrible thing, and that's happening all over this country. If you are a conservative teacher, you have to find, if, if not out front and out, out uh, like blatant, at least covert and like subtle ways to talk to your students about these kind of things. Because there is no reason why, why professors should be going in as conservatives and cowing to what the left wants them to do. You are responsible. I say this truly because you took this job. No one forced you to become a professor. No one forced you to become a teacher. You are responsible for the well-being of teaching these students a lot of things that their parents don't teach them. And if you are too scared as a conservative to teach them the right things, then you need to quit your job anyway. 
you need to quit your job anyway and get a new job. Because if you're too scared to say it, then I don't know what you're doing in a field where you are raising the next generation of people in this country. Stand up for what you believe in, Dr. Rock. Rock on. Rock on. All right. <laughs> Just one more. All right. Last one. This is from Just Cake. Um, Just Cake. Just, yeah. No ice cream. <laughs> no, I, nothing else. Just. Don't get it twisted. Just Cake. Um, just cake's question is how do I tell my left leaning friends, uh, just as left friends, I'm sorry, I have to be accurate here. How do I tell my left friends the truth about the lies they believe without coming off aggressive? Thank you, Taylor, for immaculately reading that question. Just cake. You have to ask them the questions and make it so that you explain, uh, or so that they have to explain their rationale back to you. And I've said this a lot of times. It's why my videos, I think... I'm really successful with them on changing minds and having people watch and have their minds change because I ask the question and then they have to tell me their answer and then I lead them. I keep, you know, it takes a lot of practice. It doesn't just come to come to a lot of people naturally to ask these questions like this without getting frustrated. But you have to ask them the question, say, you know, why do you think the world is going to end in 12 years instead of climate change isn't real? You know what I mean? It's like if you ask them the question, they then have to explain it to you and then you say, well, why do you think that? What evidence, do you, you know, and you go, you're going back and forth with them that way. It's a much better way to change someone's mind because they're changing their minds their, themselves. You're kind of just their, their guide on that process. So be a guide, be someone who actually wants to have legit conversations with them instead of just going up to them and telling them how to think. I mean, I do a lot of my interviews and these people, they don't even know that I'm a conservative by the end of it because I was just asking them questions and was still able to educate them and change their minds. You know, they might not even know that they're a conservative uh, or that they now believe conservative principles once they're done, which to me I think is a, a good thing because it's common sense values. It doesn't always have to have some sort of label on it. Just as long as it's common sense values that these people can believe in and you are the one to help guide them there, I think it's a good thing. And with that, thank you guys so much for watching. We got all this cool new stuff now. We got two cameras. We got Taylor still here behind the scenes. New mic. I mean, all sorts of great stuff. We're really trying to improve this podcast because I care about you guys, the listeners, and I really appreciate you guys tuning in every single week. Thank you so much. Friday, September 25th, uh, 7 p.m., Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. If you are in Los Angeles or in the Southern California area, would love it if you could be there. I have the graphic up on the screen now so you guys can see all the information. But Friday, September 25th, 7 p.m., Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. And remember, go to Apple Podcasts, rate this five stars, leave a nice comment. And that's about all we got for this week, guys. Remember, follow me on social media for all updates on things going on. Will, Witt and PragerU. We'll see you guys next week. Peace.